respectable. I think that means well-behaved in the community. That, mean, that requires that you get to know something about them. That one thing that the pastor search team is going to be doing is checking on all kinds of references. These people don't all live around here. They live off somewhere. But you need to check on the references, not just the ones he gives because everybody's got a few friends that they include on their resume. But the pastor search team is going to be asking for references from references. Who do you know that also knows this person that he might not have given their name? Respectable. Is he well behaved? What's his behavior like? Is he a guy that can keep his hands off of the women in the church? That's important, folks, today. I want to I want to tell you, that's important today. Many a man has ruined his ministry because he couldn't do that. He wasn't satisfied with the only wife God had given him. And it's a shame to say that, but you must be careful because if you're not careful, who's going to be? And so that's important. Someone who's respectable. And he goes on to talk about hospitable. Not just respectable, but hospitable. Uh, yeah, that means maybe can his wife cook a good meal? Can he do a good barbecue in the backyard for people that come over to visit? Is his house open to people? Because you see, strangers drop by, Christian strangers. They need to be made to feel welcome. Hospitality is really important. In looking at a pastor, you want to find somebody who can be hospitable, who can make friends or be friendly with other people that you meet in town. People in this town, my friends, I'm, I guarantee you, the people in Rifle, Colorado, they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Many of them do. They don't have a clue. They've got no clue what Jesus looks like. They need to know. And being hospitable or welcoming to those kind of people is important for the pastor's home, but also for him at, at the church. Be hospitable to people who come. Be able to teach. The last one listed in this verse. You know, that's the only qualification that's given for the pastor that's not given for the deacons right below this. The list beginning in verse 8. Qualification for deacons. That means they're both supposed to be good spiritual servants of the Lord. Deacons and pastors. Side by side. Basically the same qualifications, but for the pastor, he needs to be able to teach. What does that mean? It means capable of being a good teacher. Because you see, a part of that job is feeding the flock. He needs to know God's word, not just because he carries it around, but because he studied it, because he's prayed over it, because he's... When he doesn't know the answers, he sought the Holy Spirit's inspiration in his life as the teacher of the pastor. Being able to teach is a key qualification for God's under-shepherd in his church. I think you learn that by doing it. You grow as a teacher by teaching. But you also can be taught some key things in the seminary. And we've talked about that. Now, does every pastor have to be a seminary graduate? No, he doesn't. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you work hard for long hours, studying the Greek and the Hebrew and the theology, the things that you folks probably aren't interested in studying, he needs to know in order to stand before you and rightly divide the word of God. 
And that comes through partially through an education, but by applying the principles and the discipline of that education in a study. Now, does that mean he should spend 45 hours a week in the study? No, he should not. It doesn't take that long. However, it's important that he have a quality study time that's set aside in his weekly schedule so that when he stands before you on Sunday, he's prepared. He's ready to say, this is what God has shown me in my prayer time, in my study this week. This is God's message for you as a congregation. And that's important. A lot of stuff in verse 2. A lot of stuff crammed together, and it's all important. It's not that one of those is more important than the other. They're all important. Now, are you going to find somebody that can do all of those things equally well? Probably not. That's a reality of life. But they should be important to him, and they are what God looks for in his men. Now, let's look at verse 3. Very interesting passage, just like the one on the white. This is important. Not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, uncontentious, free from the love of money. It doesn't say free from money, but it says free from the love of money. That's very different. Okay, what does all that mean? Well... We live in a day and time today when chemical addiction is ruining our country. It's divided homes, divided business partners. Chemical addiction is a terrible curse upon our society today. It would have been easy, perhaps, in the day and time in which Jesus lived, or when Paul wrote these words right after that, in an area where you didn't just go out and go to the come and go next door and pick up a bottle of pure water. Water could not be safely used in many, in many cases. And so they drink wine. And I've heard all kinds of arguments about how much, what percentage of alcohol was in the wine, and it probably varied from, from distillery to distillery as, as, they, as they processed it. Addiction means control. Under the control of wine. It's interesting, in, in the uh, other part for the, for the deacons, it talks about uh, much wine. Here it says, not addicted to wine. Should not be under the control of wine. You know, why is this? Because, my friends, you can't be under the control of God's Holy Spirit and be under the control of a foreign substance at the same time. That's impossible. Now, this is what Kent says. This is not what the Scripture says. I've taken this to mean that God, doesn't, God wants me to be a teetotaler. I don't need it. I don't need wine. I don't need beer. I don't need uh, any kind of alcohol. Not that I've never tasted it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I don't need that in my life. I think being a teetotaler is the best approach, especially for your pastor. Now, does Scripture teach that taking a glass of wine is wrong? No. We're talking here about control or addiction. I'm telling you personally, from my viewpoint, I don't need it and I don't think you do. I'm telling you that I don't think it's something that's going to bring a benefit into your life. That's a personal conviction I have. I take that aside from Scripture. But what Paul says here very clearly teaches that a man should not be under the control of alcohol. I don't just say wine, I th any kind of alcohol. The, many of the kinds of alcohol we have available to us today were not available to people in this day and time. 
And so that's my belief. It allows me to seek for control of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he needs to be doing. You want your pastor to be a person that's under the control of God's Spirit. Because if he is, then he's going to lead you as a congregation in making the right kinds of decisions. Goes on to say, not uh, pugnacious. What does that mean? Another word we don't use a lot of, do we? Go around throwing around the word pugnacious, you know, all the time. Now, in the English class, an English theme, you might use that word, but that probably normal people aren't used. But back in that day and time, it was a common word. Uh, what, what does he really mean by, by not being pugnacious? It, it means combative, contentious, quarrelsome. That word is oftentimes used, King James uses, I believe, quarrelsome, uses that particular word. Possessing a violent temper. That's not what you look for in a pastor. That's not what God wants in his pastor. He does not want somebody who at the drop of a handkerchief wants to argue whether it's about theology or politics. That's not the kind of person you're looking for. Person, You've seen people that go around and, and just they love to argue things. I, I've known preachers that love to argue theology. But you know what? I've never seen one change in another one's mind yet. They just like to argue. You're not looking for somebody who's that type of person, who looks for a good fight. That's not what you look for in a pastor. I, I, I saw something on TV. I don't know, last week or so, Elaine. It was really interesting. This guy was on TV, and he was like a kickboxer. And, and, and he said it was a great way to lead people to Christ. And I got to thinking, wow, you know? <laughs> now, 